Good morning, church family. It's good to be up here again. So good to see so many of you out there today. For those of you who are joining online, thank you so much for taking time on your Sunday, this last Sunday of summer, to join us in worshiping our God. I don't know about all of you, but I'm feeling really, really inadequate this morning after seeing worship, being inspired by the baptism, just being inspired by how God has been speaking to all of us this morning. Just, whew! Lots of, lots of really positive emotions going on here and stuff like that. So this morning before we begin, I just want to open it. Before we open God's word, let's just take a moment in prayer. Our gracious God, we come before you this morning. You know what we've experienced this past week, God. You know the highs. You know the lows. You know when we kind of just drifted along and things were just kind of steady, God. But despite those different circumstances we face, God, we know that you were there with us. God, this morning I just pray that the words that I speak, they're your words, God. You know the struggles, the challenges, the revamping, the editing that went through the sermon multiple different times. So, God, this morning, I just pray that they're your words and not my words, God, that we may hear you where there's empty seats, whether it be in this physical church building or on our couch, God, or wherever. May your holy angels fill those spaces. Thank you, Jesus, that you are with us and that we can hear your voice this morning. In your name we pray. Amen. So this morning, in preparing for this, two words came to mind. Arguably the most powerful two words in our lives. The words before and the words after. I want you to think about it this morning. And if you feel comfortable shouting it out, you know, that's, that's good. I encourage participation. I want you to think about a time in your life where your life before a particular event and what your life was like after that particular event. Now... For some of you, it might be, you might remember that magical moment when you looked across the room, there was your spouse, and it was just this love at first sight, all of those kind of feelings, those butterflies, that might be your before moment, and now you think about how life is being married. For others of you, it might be that moment when you first saw your child in the delivery room, it might be that moment when you came to Canada. For others of you, though, that before and after moment might not be so good. It might kind of bring back hard, negative feelings, and just that brings you into that deep kind of dark place. For myself, I've had many defining defining moments, but the one I want to share with you this morning occurred January 24, 2008. The day started out completely normal. I was a university student at the U of R, was busy in the library doing research for a Reformation theology class, yikes, Um, and it was about 9.30 when my brother who was at the university came and found me in the library and he tapped me on the shoulder, he's like, we need to get going. I'm like, why do we need to get going? He's like, trust me when I say we need to get going. So when we got to the car, he sat down, he's like, I just got a call from the care home that mom was in and I want to let you know that mom died this morning. She died from complications from MS, asphyxiation, whole nine yards, and in that moment, all the lingo, all the whatever you want to call it, just gone. That moment, that moment in time has been seared into my memory for eternity. I remember what life was like before. I remember what life was like afterwards. I remember to this day what I ate that day, what I was wearing, how my favorite hockey team did that day, they lost. I remember every single detail. But when I think about the after side to that story, while losing mom was incredibly hard on me, I look back on that as a defining moment in my life because just a few months later, that is when I had the opportunity to encounter Jesus Christ for the first time in a real, meaningful, and powerful way. So this morning, just like how we can each think of an important moment in our lives that defines us, we can think about the before and we can think about the after. When we dig into Ephesians chapter 2 today as part of our sermon series, we're going to see how life was like before we met Jesus 
And then that opportunity of what life can be like after we meet Jesus if we just listen. So for our purposes of our time together today, we're going to break things into what I hope is three key sections. First of all, there's a problem. Secondly, what is the solution to that problem? And then how do we live, thirdly, how do we live after that problem has been solved? So if you have your Bibles with you, whether that be a physical copy or on your cell phone, what we're going to do is we're going to start out by reading Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 to 3. And in this section, we're going to talk about the human condition. And it says this, And you were dead in the trespasses and sins, in which you once walked, following the course of this world, Following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit is now at work in the sons of disobedience. Among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. So here we go. Here is a kind of a breakdown of the human condition that the Apostle Paul gives in Ephesians chapter 3. And right off the get-go, let's be honest, Paul doesn't pull any punches when he describes the human condition. He indicates that we are dead in our trespasses and sins. Yes, we may be physically alive, but we are spiritually dead. We're kind of like zombies just wandering around roaming, but we don't really have that higher calling, that higher purpose in our lives. Paul goes on to say, we're followers of Satan. We are doing, following our passions, our desires that are not godly. And lastly, we're children of wrath. Wow. Like deep hitting hard right off the get-go. But Paul is reminding the audience here, for this particular audience, that we were followers of Satan. We're children of wrath, and this all comes back from the beginning of the human story when Adam and Eve first sinned. And since then, every generation, every individual who has followed after that has followed in this path of sin. We've rejected God. We've been following our own passions. And as part of being spiritually dead, we experience that ultimate separation from God. That when we sin, we separate ourselves more and more from God, and we lose sight of the truth, the love, and the life that God has set for us. Well, it may not be popular to say it, and it may not be popular in the world today, but when we live apart from God, I have to say that we are following Satan. Jesus kind of alludes to this in Matthew chapter 6, verse 24, where he says, No one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you will be devoted to one and despise the other. You can't have it both ways in the relationship. Pastor John Piper from Discovering God Ministries describes the human condition in this way. Imagine the worst possible situation you could be in. Perhaps you're in a hostage situation. Perhaps the bank that you're attending is getting robbed. You're trapped outside in a deadly storm. Your situation is truly dire, and it's truly a life and death situation. Now, whatever crisis you may be thinking of in this moment, there is nothing more critical, more urgent, or threatening than living a life without a Savior who is Jesus Christ. Essentially, no matter how hard I try, no matter how hard you try, no one in this room or in this world can live up to the standard of holiness that God has placed before on our own. No matter how hard we try, our internal nature says, I'm inclined to sin. I'm inclined to disobey God. This inclination towards disobedience as I mentioned earlier, is directly correlated from the first fall, at the time of the fall. Furthermore, Paul indicates our sinful nature has us chasing right after Satan, and that we are sons of disobedience. I'm not sure about you, but this is not truly that warm and fuzzy start to the sermon that probably anybody was expecting. Paul reminds us very early on, this is our human condition. And I think that's important for us today to acknowledge that human condition. 
and where we were before, and that once again, I want to call it that keyword, where we were before we encountered Jesus Christ. As such, because we are sinful, Ephesians tells us that we deserve punishment and God's wrath. So you might be thinking this morning, this is the problem. What is the solution? So what we're going to do is we're going to read the next section of verses, and we're going to read verses 4 to verse 10 in chapter 2 of Ephesians. And it says this, But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved, and raised us up with him, and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and it is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. Verse 4 stands out to me. Right off the get-go, you hear the words, the two words, but God. I want to emphasize the word but. Most of the time, in if you're reading a book or if you're reading a story, the word but is just simply a word on the page and you keep going. But the Apostle Paul is very, to my opinion, very clear and he has a very key reason why that word but is there is that word but places conditional value on everything else that came before it. The word but reminds us that while everything before it may be true, but there is now a sense of hope with what comes after. Everything that occurred before now is conditional on what follows after the word but. Additionally, when you look at the verses, verses 1 to 3, you're going to notice that everything there occurred in the past tense. The reason for everything being in past tense is directly to what we read in verses 4 to 6. It says, But God, being rich in mercy and because of his great love for us, that even though we were spiritually dead in our sins, he gave us the gift of life when he rose Christ from the dead. Verses 4 to 6 to me are essentially the heart of the gospel message. They're the heart of Jesus, that he gave his gift of life for each one of us so that we may have life with him. Think about it for a moment. Because God is rich in mercy, and in view of his incredible love, everything about that previous condition has changed. Before we were walking in the passions of the world, we were following the ways of Satan, but now, because of but God, our situation has forever changed. When we, as individuals, choose to be united with Christ, we become clothed in his righteousness and can be called children of the Most High God. Romans 5, verse 8, one of my favorite verses, verses sums it up perfectly when it states, But God shows his love for us that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. While it may sound cliche, and it's something that if you've grown up in the church, you've heard quite a bit, what incredible, unfathomable, what lavished grace that God has given each one of us, that even though we were sinners, Christ died for us, he still pursued us with his unfailing love, and that he was willing to die on the cross so that each one of us could have life, and life with him to the fullest, both now and in eternity. So this morning, you may be wrestling with this concept of grace. How does it fit in for me? You may be thinking, how can God possibly accept me when I've done so many terrible things, or even if I haven't done anything terrible, I've chosen to live my life apart from him? How can God truly love me when I've done essentially the opposite of everything that he's wanted for me. This morning, I want to share with you that grace means that you get something that you don't deserve. Think about it in the classroom sense. 
It's like getting an A plus on your report card for a class that you rarely attended, you never did any of the homework, and you did very poorly on the tests. God's incredible grace saw you. God's incredible grace saw me in my condition. He saw that Harrison Hall was spiritually dead, but yet because of his unfailing love, has chosen to give me the most incredible gift of Jesus. And guess what, church? For all of you, he does the exact same thing. He saw us in our hopeless condition, and yet he sent Jesus so that we could have that opportunity to accept him if we just accept that free gift of life. So despite this incredible gift of grace being shown towards us, I think that we all fall into the trap of I don't measure up to God's goodness. I don't deserve God's grace in my life. Instead, we begin to live our lives thinking that I need to do something, that we need to do something in order to get into God's good books. Moving to verses 8 and 9, which we've already read, these are arguably some of the most well-known verses in the New Testament, if not the whole of Scripture. If these are verses that you have not taken the opportunity to memorize, here's my challenge for this week. Take the time, memorize it, instill them deep within your heart. And it says, for by grace you are saved through faith. This is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. I want you to take a moment right now and reflect about God's incredible grace in your life. How has God shown up in your life? How has God shown you him throughout all of your different circumstances? As we talked about the beginning, think about your life before Jesus. Think of your life after you encountered Jesus. And if you're in this room today, or if you're online today, and if you've never encountered Jesus, today could be that opportunity where you truly encountered Jesus Christ for the very first time. Scripture says that, Today, beloved, today can be your day of salvation. Remember, as you think, that your salvation is not based on anything that you can do. Your salvation is not dependent on who I vote for, who I work for, my background, how long I've been in the church. God's free gift is out there for everyone. So we might be thinking this morning, we will come, we're going to come back to this in just a moment. But we all too often, we think about how we have to do something to get God's free gift. So in my professional life, I have an opportunity to lead 16 incredible people across the country in, kind of in their work. And on a monthly basis, we get to have those lovely touch points of, let's talk about how you're doing about where it's hitting targets, goals, measures that the organization has set out for you? Are you meeting those behaviors and competencies that I've set out for you, which kind of show you that you are a great employee, that you're doing well in your job, and we have that opportunity to kind of talk openly and honestly about what's going well, what's not going well, and in turn, they can also do the same thing for me. What am I doing in my role that's frustrating them and inhibiting them from having that overall success? I also kind of say, think about it if you are a parent or if you've ever interacted with a young child. And we encourage this narrative with them that if you are good, you're going to get something. True story. Don't tell my kids that I've said this. But I'm sure I've done this more times than if you're good in church, at the end of church today, when we get home, we'll have ice cream after lunch, as long as you're good and quiet in church. And I think for the longest time, this is the, cu- the culture that we live in. We believe that we have to perform, we have to act, we have to behave in a certain way in order to gain something, whether that be our salary or whether that be something very simple like, hey, you're going to get a treat after church if you're just quiet while dad's up here. And I think this is one of the biggest things that the enemy has used against us individually and as in the church, where we take that culture of the world that we live in, 
And then we bring that into the church that says, I need to do something in order to gain God's favor. I need to do something in order to gain God's gift of grace and salvation. I'm going to share with you a personal story, and a story that hits home just a little bit, and one of those that, as I said at the beginning, wasn't sure as I went through the sermon, but I want to be honest with you this morning. When Karen and I first started attending Rosewood back in 2015, I had come from a church background where performing certain rituals and traditions were seen as important. So I remember when I started coming here, just this overwhelming sense of guilt I'm, going to, I'm even going to go so far as to say this, almost a sense of failure in my relationship with God, because as I transitioned here, more and more of those rituals and traditions, well, good in a previous time, they just weren't what God was calling me to do. So I remember I would come here, and I'm like, I need to do something. I need to be involved in some way, just so that I can get God's good, keeping God's good graces, because if I don't, it's not going to end well at the end of the story and stuff like that. And so for those first number of months, I felt this, like I'm lacking of faith. I'm not trusting God. But as time went by, God spoke to me, and he reminded me, he said, Harrison, my gift of salvation is by grace through faith. There is nothing else that you need to do other than just simply believe in me. And God brought me from this place of where I needed to do things into this after place where God has brought me to a place where I simply just need to trust and rely on him, and I know that is sufficient enough. His grace is sufficient for me. This morning, I want you to stop, pause. I do a lot of reflecting as I kind of write, and I hope I want to get you to think and reflect just for a moment yourself. If you think about your own spiritual journey, where are you attempting to do things or perform in a certain way to gain God's good graces? If you're not in that place, praise God, I'm thrilled that that would be your experience. But I think naturally we are all inclined where we feel we need to do something in order to do, have God's good graces. But this morning, I want to encourage you with the following. And if there's nothing you else you take away from our time together today, it's this. There is nothing you could, can, or ever will do that will earn you God's grace or his free gift of salvation. It's free. I don't know about you, but I like free things. God's gift of salvation is free, and it's available for me. It's available for you. And it's available for everyone who's outside of this room. It's available for our community, our city, our province, and our world at large. All people need to do is accept that free gift. Scripture says in Acts 16, verse 31, Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, you and your household, and you will be saved. Today, be encouraged that the gift of salvation is free and it's waiting for you. So moving into our final verse, I do want to spend some time focusing on verse 10. And it says this. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So, Paul, in this verse, is addressing who, what our true identity is, who we can be in Jesus Christ. So we've had the before, where we were walking the ways of our own passions and desires. We've now been moving towards saved by grace. And because in this after effect, we have no choice but to recognize that we are saved by grace and we are Christ's workmanship. You are a workmanship. Think about your hobbies for a minute, whether you're quilting, cake decorating, woodworking. Our hobbies are a work of art, and that's what we are. God is working at refining us. God is working at perfecting us so that we can continue to move towards good works. 
In this section of the verse, there's a fascinating Greek word, and I apologize if you speak Greek, I'm going to brutalize it, poema, which roughly translates into a work of art. Not just something that's made, it's something that's made with care, it's made with love, it's made with attention. It's like paintings. That's we are. That's what we are. We are God's painting. We are his special project, and he's continually working and refining us into being his workmanship. He's working on us even right now in this very moment. He's putting just the right touches on us, and he's doing this so that we can be prepared to do good works for him. Now, don't confuse the fact that I'm talking about doing good works with God's gift of salvation. Two very different things. But because we are saved, God has called us as believers to do good works. Now, when you hear the word workmanship, do you feel you're a workmanship, a piece of art, this priceless treasure? Maybe you have a very negative view of yourself. To you, maybe you just feel average. Maybe you feel below average. You think that, you know what, if I was a piece of clothing or fabric or a project, I would be stuffed into the back of the closet where nobody could ever find me until such time somebody moved out of that house and found it in the back corner. But what I want to share with you all this morning is that no matter where you've come from, what you've experienced, whatever challenges you've encountered in your life, you are Christ's workmanship. And Paul says, for your workmanship, created in Christ Jesus. What does that part, created in Christ Jesus, mean? Let me explain this way. I know my wife, Karen, when she's going to start a knitting project or a crocheting project, inevitably it's going to mean a trip to Michael's. Now, whenever that trip to Michael's occurs, she's going to go scouring throughout all of the yarn, all the different craft supplies to find the ultimate yarn, the best possible yarn, so that when she makes that sweater, she makes that project, that sweater is going to be able to hold up to all of the different trials that it faces. It's going to hold up to the washing machine. It's going to hold up to the kids kind of ripping and tearing at it. It's going to be able to be something that she can wear with pride and be excited that, look what I've done. This is what I've created. And I think usually when we start the project, we start from with the best possible materials in mind. If you're a woodworker, you don't get the wood that's warped. Maybe you do, but more often than not, you're going to be starting with the best possible materials. But what Ephesians chapter 2 kind of shares with us is that Christ has been working with us as his workmanship, but yet we were flawed material. Remember what we read in verses 1 to 3, that we were dead in our sins. We were spiritually dead, but yet... God saw fit to call each one of us his workmanship. To me, right then and there, this is an example of God's incredible grace towards us. This is God's incredible blessing towards us. In Christ Jesus, we are created to do good works, here and now. And that's just an extension of the grace that we receive. Our privilege, responsibility, and calling as Christ's followers is to do good works. And by doing good works, we show love to our neighbors. We help people in our community who are in need. We provide words of encouragement to the downtrodden. We as individuals and as a church are called to be that workmanship. We're called to reflect Jesus in both our words and in our actions. In closing, today, I want you to think about your before story, and I want you to think about your after story. How has God worked in your life and taken you from the ways of this world and brought you into a relationship with Jesus Christ? As I said earlier, if you haven't made that choice, today can be that day where you accept that free gift of salvation. For those who've accepted that gift, I want to ask you the question, though. Are you living in a way that honors that gift that God has given you? Are you living up to be that workmanship? Are you performing good works, not because you need them for salvation, but because Jesus has called each one of us as believers to demonstrate our love for him by showing love, care, and compassion to those in our community. If you're listening today, whether you're online 
or whether you're in the building today and you haven't accepted God's free gift of salvation, might I encourage you to contemplate? Might I encourage you to consider accepting that free gift? It's free after all. And Jesus is calling each one of us into that relationship with him. As scripture states, there's absolutely nothing you need to do. There's no actions you need to take other than just say, I believe, I have faith in you, Jesus, for what you've done for me. If you're unsure of where to begin on this journey with Jesus, I want to encourage you to take a moment after the service. Pastor Dan, Kim, myself, anybody in this around you will be willing and excited to help you along that journey with Jesus. In closing, here are a couple of our questions for us to contemplate as we go into the week. Number one, I want you to think about, reflect, and pray on where you have chosen to attempt earning God's favor through your actions. Number two, pray that God brings at least one individual into your life so that you can share the good news of God's free gift. Church, I'm going to close with a very well-known verse, John 3.16. I think it sums up all of this very, very well. For God so loved the world that he gave, a, gave his only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Today, in the quietness of your heart as we begin singing our next song, may we stop and reflect and see how God is speaking to us. And I encourage you to accept that free gift of grace because at the end of the day, you have been saved through faith. You're saved through faith. There's nothing that you can do other than that. There's no actions. Just simply believe. And I want you after that to think about how God could take you from your before and move you to your after. Let's pray. God, in the quietness of this moment, we just stop, pause, and reflect and think about the ways that you have worked in our lives. For those who have accepted Jesus, I want, just want to say thank you for the way that you saw us in our before and the ways that you have now moved us into this after, God, where we are all viewed as your workmanship. For those who have not accepted you, Jesus, for whatever reason, may today be that day of salvation, God, where there's, we recognize and we understand that there's nothing that I can do on my own strength, my own power, to gain salvation, but instead it is a free gift from God. May we now go into the world, God, recognizing that we are your workmanship and we've been created for good works. May we as individuals in a church be galvanized to reach out to our neighbors, to our colleagues, to our people in our classroom, God, whoever you put in our path, God, so that we can share that free gift with them and share with them the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. Thank you for your word and your love that you show us. Amen.